Thank you. Yes, um, I'm Noam Zilberstein from Cornell, and I'm very presenting this work uh, with my collaborators. So I want to start with a. Uh, oh, sorry. More technical difficulty. But it's better. Still conference. <laughs> So Hoare logic gives you a single assertion to describe the start states and a single assertion to describe the end states. And it says, if I run up the program in some state satisfying the precondition, then I end up in a state satisfying the postcondition. And given that we just have this one assertion, the best thing we can do is to kind of use a disjunction to say, well, either uh, this program will terminate in a state, or it will terminate successfully in a state with x pointing to one, or it will crash uh, because x is null. And the question is, well, does this actually characterize the bug? And the answer is no, because this disjunction isn't really expressive enough to tell us that the error can actually happen, right? It's possible that all of the program traces are going to fall into the first disjunct, and the error is not actually realized by a real execution. So to see this kind of more pictorially, let's look at the semantics of a non-deterministic program. Right, you start in some state, here we call it sigma, and then you may end in one of many states, which here we, we call tau. And what Hoare logic allows you to do is kind of draw circles around the valid start states and the end states, uh, and you, know, you use those uh, pre and post conditions to describe the behavior of the program. So more specifically, any start state in this blue circle will end up inside of the uh, green circle when the program executes. So given that this is what we call correctness, you could ask, well, what is, what is incorrectness? Incorrectness should be the logical negation of this, which means there is some valid start state that's going to end up outside of the post condition. And if the program is completely deterministic, then we can kind of just shrink the precondition until we're just characterizing this bad start state and prove that that ends up inside of some umbrella of bad end states. And then you've kind of proved that the program has a bug. The problem is that uh, a lot of programs have effects, like non-determinism, such as the, the Malik program that we saw at the beginning. And when the program is non-deterministic, you may have some states ending up in, a, uh, uh, some end states ending up you know, in good outcomes and some ending up in bad ones. And we need some way to isolate the bad outcome, which Hoare logic doesn't really give us a way of doing. So let's go back to the picture of what, what does a Hoare triple kind of look like pictorially. Uh, you can see this program has this branching behavior, right? So we start in one state, but we end up in one of many states. And what we do in outcome logic is we kind of say, well, why should you just get this one assertion to describe all of the end states? Why not give you an assertion to describe each of the outcomes? So that's kind of the idea behind outcome logic uh, intuitively. But let's look at how we actually formalize this. So the semantics of outcome logic triples uh, are kind of similar to Hoare logic. You have these triples with preconditions and postconditions. And at a high level, uh, the precondition describes valid start configurations, and the postcondition describes what's going to happen when you run the program. But now, uh, the pre- and postconditions are satisfied by sets of states rather than individual states. And that's going to allow us to talk more about the branching behavior that the program exhibits. So in order to just talk about the branching, we need uh, some sort of language you know, to talk about that. So we have these outcome assertions. And the outcome assertions have a lot of standard things like true, false, uh, conjunctions, and disjunctions. But there are also a few new constructs as well. The first new construct is what we call the outcome conjunction, this O plus thing. And what this tells us is if we have some set of states satisfying phi and some set of states satisfying psi, uh, then their union satisfies the outcome conjunction of those two uh, assertions. So you can kind of split the set of outcomes into two parts and describe them individually. And then P, we use the Latin letters uh, as kind of atomic assertions or primitive assertions to talk about individual outcomes. Uh, which where, you know, every, so every state in the set of outcomes must satisfy P, but we also require that the set of outcomes is non-empty. So this, this outcome is non-vacuously reached. And using all of these constructs, we can now describe the bug that we 
uh, were originally looking at. So essentially what we've done here is we took the HoreLogic specification we were looking at at the beginning, but we've replaced the disjunction, which wasn't expressive enough to describe the bug, with this outcome conjunction, and we now see that both of these outcomes are non-vacuously reached by actual program executions. So in particular, what this means is, well, the error is definitely reachable. So that tells us we're describing the bug. Uh, but the problem is, well, maybe it's not so much of a semantic problem, but we are still carrying around information about this OK execution, which isn't really relevant from a bug finding point of view. But even worse, uh, you know, you could imagine that maybe this program isn't just two lines. It's like these two lines followed by a million more lines. And uh, once we get to the point where the program has crashed, we know that you know, nothing else is going to happen to that trace. But we shouldn't really have to analyze the next one million lines in order to see where the OK outcome is going to end up. So what can we do there? I mean, this, this is the under approximation that I was alluding to at the beginning. What can we do here? Well, we can kind of just rearrange this post condition. Uh, we can drop the OK outcome and replace it with true. True is an assertion that describes any set of states. And now what we're saying is, well, this error is still reachable, but uh, maybe something else happens too. You know, maybe there are other outcomes. And uh, that true is sa vacuously satisfied by any outcome, so we don't really have to keep examining the rest of the program. Going back to the pictorial world, what this kind of looks like is, uh, in the post condition, we draw this circle around the bug. We call that Q. And then we draw another circle around everything else that could happen. And we just say, well, all of this is vacuously satisfied by true. Um, OK, so we've now seen uh, kind of anecdotally that outcome logic can describe bugs. But we actually have a more formal result as well, which essentially says that uh, any specification that's false can be disproven in outcome logic. So this, you can kind of read this uh, theorem in two directions. If you look at the top, you see this, uh, this triple. What you, you think about this is, this is kind of what you want the program to do. Uh, but if it's not semantically valid, then going down, we can see, well, there must be some other outcome logic triple uh, that you can, that is valid. And then going up, we say, if you prove this other triple, then you've disproven the original specification. So one question, I mean, you may have heard of incorrectness logic. And one question you may ask is, how does this compare to incorrectness logic? So you can use, you can use both of these logics to describe bugs, particularly the type of bugs we were looking at where you know, we're trying to find uh, programs that crash due to memory errors. But the semantic description of the bugs you get is quite different. So in outcome logic, what we say is, if you run the program in any state, uh, Segfaulting is one of the possible outcomes. In incorrectness logic, you say any crash state where x is null is reachable via some execution from some start state. And then you may ask, well, which of these semantics is kind of more preferable? Um, and the answer, or one answer, comes from uh, a paper from Uppsala last year, which talks about manifest errors. The idea of manifest errors is that it's really useful to be able to know what uh, initial conditions you have to satisfy in order to force one of these bugs to occur. And you can see in outcome logic, uh, we immediately know in, in this example that uh, this bug can occur starting in any start state. Whereas in incorrectness logic, we just know that it will occur in some start state. So the semantics of outcome logic makes it a lot easier to identify these manifest errors. OK, another thing is that you may ask is, well, OK, we've, we've showed this theorem of uh, you know, that you can disprove any specification. But what do these disproofs kind of look like? More, more uh, specifically, you know, I showed this picture before that this is kind of what a valid outcome logic triple looks like. But how can this specification be false? Well, there's kind of two ways that this can be false. The first one is that uh, something bad sometimes occurs. And this, these are the type of bugs that incorrectness logic also deals with. But there's actually another way that this can be false, which is that one of these good outcomes never occurs. 
And this is also something you can prove with outcome logic, but it's not possible to prove this with incorrectness logic. So I started by asking, can a single program logic handle correctness and incorrectness? Let's kind of up the stakes a little bit and say, well, can we handle correctness and incorrectness with effects? Uh, and so in the paper, the actual formalism we use isn't really based on sets, but is rather based on, uh, it's parametric on some monad. So you can, uh, you can instantiate this logic with a variety of different types of effects and prove correctness and incorrectness uh, in, in those different scenarios. And one such effect is for probabilistic programs. So you can imagine that maybe you don't just want to know if some bug is reachable, but you want to quantify how likely the bug is to occur. And one example where that may uh, come up is if you're dealing with some sort of distributed program that's communicating over a network, uh, that, but the network is unreliable and may drop messages, and then you want to bound uh, how likely is an error to occur. And so in this case we say, well, this program will succeed with probability 99%. Okay, so I started with this quote, program correctness and incorrectness are two sides of the same coin. I hope I've now convinced you that uh, correctness and incorrectness are actually just two usages of one program logic. And with that, uh, I'm happy to take questions. We have time for three or four questions. Uh, thank you for the great talk. So at the beginning when you were giving the semantics to this outcome conjunction, you used union. And my question is that, like, if you change that to disjoint union, do you, like, the, what would be the effect? Yeah, so I think at first glance it may seem like disjoint union is actually what you want. But it doesn't actually work so well in terms of program semantics because you can imagine that uh, you branch into two non-deterministic paths. It's possible that both of those non-deterministic paths uh, kind of end up in the same end state. And if you use disjoint union, then you can't encode the semantics of that program. Thank you. So it's a very interesting idea. So I have a rather naive question regarding, like you mentioned, in the post condition, you can write OK and error, which I'm wondering if they are just tags or you even have some way to express because even for non-deterministic programs, uh, maybe we also want to, uh, want to know that, for example, which, under which cases we can trigger this bug because that's, you know, how you exactly find the bug to confirm that, you know, the developers can confirm according to this kind of condition. Yeah, so they are kind of tags, but they also, I mean, exceptions are another effect. So I kind of glazed over this, but you also need to have some sort of a monadic execution model to encode. Uh, so so mean there are ways to encode like what are the more like underlying semantics or model for these tags? Sure, yeah, you, you could, yeah. Thanks. Hey, uh, thanks for a nice talk. Um, I had a question about this uh, dropping or not um, inspecting this other code once you found a bug. Um, so do I interpret correctly that if you find um, error x is null o plus top as there is also some execution which doesn't error since the non-empty condition? So the non-empty condition is only on the primitive assertions. So top is also satisfied by empty set. Ah, okay. And you can imagine, I mean, maybe there is a non-deterministic choice, so you kind of say, well, there, we, we can witness that there's another thing, but it's possible that that execution diverges. Yeah, exactly, and that then, was my question. So, but it's still valid in that case. Thanks. Thanks for the super interesting talk. So um, I guess with all these things in terms of over and under approximation, the challenge is really figuring out what do you do? Do you have partial correctness? Do you have total correctness? Can you distinguish that in the outcomes or is that somehow built in already? Yes, so uh, outcome logic in this, in this formalization is sort of between partial and total correctness. It's not really total correctness because it's based on a finite trace semantics. So you, you can prove, for example, that the program always diverges. You can prove that it sometimes terminates, but you can't prove that, it's, that it always terminates or that it sometimes diverges, which is something that we're working on extending. Uh, but yeah, you can encode partial correctness by basically, I mean, because these, these primitive assertions guarantee some sort of reachability. 
So you just take a disjunction of that with like something that says that the set of outcomes is empty, and then that's partial correctness. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.